Slam Dunk. Our guest today is uh, a very special guest, uh, Dr. Sheikh Hakim Abdul Hakim Quick. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Well, alaikum salam, salam. Uh, Sheikh, uh, for, just for the viewers, if you can give us a, a brief explanation about your background, where you come from, and uh, when you embraced Islam. Mm. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wassalatu wassalamu rasulullah wa ba'd. Well, basically, uh, I'm North American, and I, and I come from the city of Boston uh, in the United States. Uh, and, um, you know, as you said, I was raised as an African American. And uh, from early uh, times in my life, you know, I questioned my heritage because it is a mixed heritage. Uh, my grandmother was a Mohawk, or the Mohawk Nation. Uh, and so I questioned uh, the history of the country, my own identity, and then even my religious uh, faith as well. Um, uh, what, um, what effect did Islam have on slaves back in the day and when it freed them? Yeah. And how did that influence other African Americans or other slaves to come into Islam? Mm -hmm. um, what is important for people to understand uh, that America as we see it today uh, or in the past 200 years is only one small section of the history of this, uh, these continents. That people have been traveling back and forth across the Pacific and the Atlantic uh, for thousands of years. And um, even before Columbus, uh, even before the society that, that we know today, um, there was actually some contact um, uh, with uh, the, the, the other parts of the world. And so there were Muslims here be before Columbus. Uh, and they came across on the currents, they came from Mali, they came from Spain, and they actually mixed with the um, local uh, uh, indigenous people. During the slavery period, um, the slaves were mainly taken from West Africa and from Central Africa as well. And we have documented evidence to show that over 30% uh, of the slaves were actually Muslims. And um, they came from um, highly educated backgrounds, um, highly developed societies. And um, there's clear evidence to show now that amongst the slaves there were ulama, there were scholars. And so what has come to the surface now is documentation in the Arabic language. Uh, there are scholars who wrote the whole Quran from their memory. Uh, other scholars wrote the Risal of Ibn Abi Zayd al Qaidawani, a Maliki scholar, uh, from their memory. And there's different pieces being put together now to show um, that Muslims were a, a large part of the slave population and also that they resisted slavery. So there were resistance movements um, right from West Africa and um, in, in, in Brazil there was a great slave revolt in 1835 um, uh, which was led by Muslims from um, what is now Nigeria and is against the Portuguese and it was so powerful that the Portuguese let them go and you can actually go to uh, Lagos and you can pray in a Brazilian mosque, because they returned. Um, there was also resistance in Suriname, which is Dutch Guyana. And uh, a group of, uh, called the Bush Blacks, their leader was called Arabi. And uh, his imam was called Zamzam, like Zamzam water. water right. um, in Trinidad, there was a, a society of free Mandingos who came from uh, West Africa, and some of their remains and plantations are still there today. Uh, in Jamaica, uh, in the 1820s, there was a, they were passing, passing around a document called Wathika. And this document is, we, we can relate this to a great scholar in West Africa, Sheikh Uthman Danfodio. Um, so these were ulama who came and they were passing documents from the capital of Kingston uh, to the countryside. They were communicating in classical Arabic. Uh, in the Bahamas, in the island of Exuma, there was a document where the, the, the slave owner, he said, that um, the people on this island are followers of Mahomet. He said the word Mahomet. And we know this is the Middle Age way of saying uh, Muhammad. So, Sallam. And so um, these were Muslims all on this island in the Bahamas. In the United States, in the Carolinas, in the Gullah Islands off, off the coast of the Carolinas, uh, there's strong proof of Muslims all over the United States. Uh, and so uh, Islam was very powerful amongst the slaves. But the pain of slavery. Uh, father and mother being separated from the children. Uh, it was prohibited to fast. If you said anything in Arabic or used any Islamic terms, they would torture you to death in front of the other slaves. And so after a, a few generations, it was lost. But by the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jalla and dua that came from the slaves, um, the areas of Georgia and South Carolina, when people migrated north, um, they uh, recognized that they were something else. 
And so um, great movements, Islamic movements, came out of these people who had this Muslim background. So it's all coming to the surface now that, that, that Mus Islam was actually part of American society. It was not something that a foreign, it's not a foreign thing which just came in the past few years. But it's been a solid part of, of uh, American society. And there's so many examples of this and, um, you know, the reality of it, uh, you know, is, is actually coming to the surface. I mean, even President Obama himself, when he made his Cairo speech, you know, he spoke about um, the, the, the early uh, 13 colonies. The first country to recognize America was Morocco. And it was the Sultan of Morocco who made a peace treaty. Uh, and he accepted the 13 colonies before anybody else. He's Muslim. Okay? So Islam really has played uh, a very important role in the history. But unfortunately, it was covered up. In the same way they said Columbus discovered America, uh, in, in the same way they said you know, that uh, Balboa you know, discovered the Pacific, and you know, they, they've covered up history and changed it. But now it's coming to the surface, you know, the reality of the presence of Islam. Uh, what's Islam outlook or uh, a view on racism in different nationalities? Well, of course, we know that um, racism is something which is forbidden in Islam. And if we go back to the, the first uh, scenario with human beings, when Adam alayhi salam was, 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 cre was created, and he was taken to the company of the angels, and then you know, Allah told him, you know, the angels, usjudu li Adam, fasajadu illa iblis. That iblis, he said, bow down to Adam. And they all bowed down except for the jinni iblis, who was amongst the angels. And his excuse was, you created me from fire, and you created him from clay. So he was a racist in that he refused to accept you know, the identity of Adam because he wasn't like him. So it's this type of mentality. And so um, part of the message has always been a struggle against racism. The Prophet ﷺ, right from the beginning, surrounded himself with people of all different nationalities. Um, and you know, his rainbow coalition, so to speak, um, struggled against Arab nationalism and the tyranny of Quraysh. So, so the message of Islam breaks down racism, and Muslims have to, have to deal with this. And, but this is one of the big crises we are facing today. And I'm seeing this everywhere I travel, tribalism, nationalism, uh, color consciousness. Um, it's come back. It, it, it's really uh, one of the sicknesses that, that, that's faced in the Muslim world today. And, and I would say that you know, for a proper Islamic education, especially for those who are involved in dawah, they should take anti-racism. They, they need to um, appreciate other races and realize that color differences between uh, ourselves, these are physical constructs. It has nothing to do with our soul or our essence. And, and, but, but this is something we have to revisit today so because can, it's what, causing confusion. So what can we do as Muslims and non-Muslims to reduce racism out there? Part of racism, and when you look at racism, there's really three aspects of racism. There's the ideological aspect. Okay? The basis of racism is a, is a belief that one group is superior to another. So it's ideology. And this is where Darwinism, where they use theories of evolution uh, and that the final phase that, that European culture is higher than you know, third world culture, you know, it's an ideology of racism. And um, you'll find it in other civilizations. You, India has the caste system. And you'll find it in other places as well. So that's the, the basis is ideology. And the other aspect of racism is, is the racist uh, terminologies. So you call people names, racial names. But, but the final part that a lot of people don't deal with is what is called institutionalized racism. And that is where um, you are judged in terms of housing, employment, education, you're judged by the color of your skin. And when it reaches the institutionalized form, that's the worst form. This is what happened in South Africa. They called it apartheid. So in order to deal with racism, we have to deal with all aspects of it. We have to first begin with the ideological part, and Muslims need to be educated to appreciate other civilizations. I know that some people thought, I, I, I remember seeing maps of the Muslim world and, and it stopped at the Sahara Desert, although, as though Islam never spread south of the Sahara. But there are great Islamic empires. There were thousands of ulama. There's whole Islamic societies below the Sahara, man. 
but, but, but some people didn't um, really put it into their maps. And they're ignorant of Islam in Africa. Most Muslims do not understand about the history of Islam in Africa. So um, we need to be educated uh, first about history and learn to appreciate other cultures, right? And then um, struggle against that tribalism and the ignorance which forms the, the part of the ideology. And then, of course, what people usually start with is they don't call people names. That's the terminologies. But, you know, that has to be dealt with and then also institutionalize racism, you know, where your nationality or your color actually um, uh, gives you a lower status. And unfortunately, that exists in some Muslim societies today, that, that based on your ethnicity or your color, you actually get a lower second-class citizenship in society. So these are all forms of racism that have to be dealt with. And I believe that Muslims are going nowhere if they don't deal with tribalism and racism. You can go behind many of the battles going on now in the Muslim world and you probably see one tribe against another, one ethnic group against another. So it's a really important issue that has to be dealt with. And, and, and one good thing about the younger generation here in Canada and in, and, in, and in America to a certain extent, is that they, have, um, they, they don't carry a lot of the traditions of their family. So it's easier for them to break down racism, but they have to be educated uh, with history as well as Aqidah in order to overcome this problem. Um, you said you visited uh, some, some countries in South Africa, as you stated earlier. Yeah. What's their overlook on Islam? Um, is there any specific things that, that they're mis misled about in Islam? or What's their understanding about Islam in South Africa? Yeah. Okay, if you look at the southern region itself, you'll see that in the southern region, uh, there are areas where Muslims um, were the majority, like Mozambique and in Malawi and some of these countries are the majority. But in South Africa itself, um, people were not educated properly as to what is Islam. Uh, because it was a, it was a crich, Christian uh, curriculum, and so it wipes out Islam, you know, from its, uh, uh, you know, its base. And um, the Muslims were seen as a small minority of people, you know, who were either indentured laborers or and not really, really, you know, that valuable. So it was wiped out. People didn't learn uh, the history that well. Um, some parts, like in Cape Town, uh, there is a very positive thing about Muslims because Muslims came to the Cape in the 17th century, you know, as um, slaves, uh, you know, and laborers. But they had scholars amongst them, and they established masjids, they established Quran schools. And so in the Western Cape, the Western side of the country, people understand more about Islam. And Muslims are very strong. There's 150 masjids in Cape Town. But, but in Johannesburg and Durban and those other places, there's a little more tension. And, and it's not as, as positive as it is in the Western Cape. So Abdul Hakim, quick, may Allah reward you for all the good things you're doing. I want to thank you for joining the Islam Dunk. Thank you. Uh, for our viewers out there, thank you for watching Islam Dunk at the Journey of Faith 2009.